Hello and welcome to Build. I'm your host, Danny Clayton. New York, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Now, joining me in the studio, international man of mystery, adventurer, anthropologist, Josh Bernstein. It's so good to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. How are you? Are you well? Uh, have, yeah. have, have, you been, have you been busy? What have you been up to? I, I, yeah, well, I travel quite a bit. So I've, I've got a few shows in production right now around the world. So it's, it's nice to be here in New York. Yeah. I actually imagine that you rode here on your horse, uh, <laughs> that you parked it outside somewhere on Broadway. But I really want to take you back 14 years ago to Digging for the Truth. Now, this is a show which introduced your work to me uh, and something I just loved because it made history and knowledge fun and sexy and cool. Now, if we went back there that 14 years ago, what was it like shooting that first episode? Uh, well, that was, yeah, that seems like a lifetime ago, and certainly in, in the TV space. For me, though, you know, for, for uh, context, I had been running a wilderness survival school in Utah for, at that point, I think 20 years, and History Channel was kind enough to roll the dice and try me as a presenter for Digging for the Truth. Mm. And um, it merged my degree in anthropology with my wilderness guide ethos of getting immersive and going the sort of to the ends of the earth to bring these stories to life. So when history said, would you like to go into the temples and tombs of our planet and explore the greatest cultural mysteries, I was like, yeah, of course. So who, would, you know, who, would, who would not say yes to that? So, and then the fact that the show found an audience in this country and in Australia and so many other countries around the world was for me a dream job. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it was wildly successful. It was one of the highest, I think, the highest rating show uh, at its time. Um, when did you know that it was working? When did you go, all right, this is, this is actually something? We knew, well, uh, that was my first time in TV, so I was kind of oblivious and naive to the whole industry, but the crew knew because they had, had other, done other shows. And so pretty quickly until I think the third or fourth episode of that season, and each season was 13 episodes, we knew we had something that was the right combination, a great production mm -hmm. company, um, you know, uh, great topics, great access, and then I worked my butt off to, yeah. to try and you know, deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, it was... It was clear once the shows got edited and then brought into the History Channel, they they knew quickly. They knew quick enough to put us in a good time slot, and mm. then the very first episode, thankfully, uh, broke all the ratings, and it just kept going from there. Yeah, I mean, from yeah. from my recollection, there were you were searching for the Ark, you were exploring tombs in Egypt. It was really exciting stuff. Were were there any episodes that really stood out for you? Um, well, there was there were a few where we almost died. That usually <laughs> sticks out. I think that. Um, you know, certainly going into the um, into tombs in Egypt was memorable. Searching for the Ark of the Covenant, going to Ethiopia was memorable. Uh, going to Easter Island was a fantastic opportunity. But the, the the stories that were off camera most hazardous when we were up in the Alps uh, looking at the Utsi, the Iceman story, and we nearly got uh, taken out by a storm. That was that was touch and go. Mm. And I mean, the cameras are put away for the for the toughest, most trying moments. And then we try and go back later and capture what we missed because we were too concerned for our, our sure. lives and well-being. But but most of the time, if you do production right, uh, you, you survive to tell the story. Wow. So thankfully. When, yeah. when have you been the most scared while filming a show? I think for, for me, having a background as a wilderness guide, especially in the survival space where you spend so much time doing risk management, we try not to get that scared or put ourselves in a situation where we could be at, uh, in, in true jeopardy. So mm -hmm. I think, and also I'm a, I'm a cave diver. I love scuba, but cave diving in particular is very high risk. And um, again, it has to do with training and preparation more than actually responding to them. I mean, you are responding to the moment, but, but I, I'm proud to say that you know, millions of miles later, I'm still here, you know, yep. knock on wood, and, 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 um, and ready to tell more adventures and more stories. <laughs> so, cave diving, uh, a brilliant cocktail of claustrophobia and the fear of drowning. Um, <laughs> sounds great. Uh, yeah. Why? Why do you do it? Well, um, it's a fair question. A lot of people, uh, it's, it's very binary. Like, you either love cave diving or you're just, that guy's crazy, right? Or that. Mm. And, and for me, the community of divers, once you get past recreational diving, which is my passion, like, I, if, you, if I'm off on vacation, I'm going to go diving. And for me to then go into the technical sphere where you're using different gas mixtures and going at different depths and using rebreathers. And then cave diving for me was the ultimate in technical performance. So cave divers have their game, like, dialed in. And so I said, I want to learn from these guys. And the benefits then, of course, if I'm doing any recreational diving, if I'm doing diving for, for a show, whether it's wrecks or reefs, or I have a, a higher skill set, which just makes it that much more enjoyable for an audience mm. that may be claustrophobic, but, but wants to at least see me go into that, that tight crevice and figure out you know, what's back there. 
Absolutely not. You'd never see me do that. I didn't <laughs> but, but you would watch it, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's all that matters. So uh, this might seem like a simplistic question, but I think it's quite important. What makes you scared? I have a pretty broad comfort zone right? because I think as a young, uh, te- as a teenager, when I went to the survival school first, I, I kept focusing on that, on growing that comfort zone. So I don't, I wouldn't say I, I'm not, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm still searching for things. I mean, certainly I have fears that are more psychological, but in terms of physical, you can put me on the top of a peak or in the bottom of the ocean or in a small mm. capsule in, in an RV. And I'll, I'll manage so far. So far, I mean, we'll see. We'll keep, we keep looking for that. Mm. Here, I'm, I'm trying to be like the tough Australian. I'm representing my country so poorly. <laughs> Shivering, you mentioning all this stuff. Um, I, I'm really excited about this new project you're working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tell me about it. Are we going to feel as uncomfortable <laughs> and scared <laughs> watching? Um, you know, hopefully there'll be a little bit of that. The the the, um, the genesis of Explorer at Large came when I was at Discovery Channel. Right, I was I was hosting a, a show called Into the Unknown that again was epic to the ends of the earth, trying to find these great adventures and mysteries for an audience. And I realized that what we were doing was for adults, mm. but kids were watching. Because right? you get ratings and you get feedback from audiences, and, and this is before social media, but there were still some early discussion forums, and people were saying, I watch the show with my kids. Teachers were writing to us saying, we play this in our classrooms. This is helping oh. us do a better job of bringing history and travel to life for kids. So, so that's when I was like, well, how do we create content that's specifically for kids, mm-hmm. right? that ties into the needs of teachers and matches up with curriculum standards, which you know, in the US, we have a lot of focus on whether it's Common Core or Next Gen, how do we actually teach and bring textbooks to life? Mm. So Explorer at Large was designed specifically to give kids and teachers a leg up into the STEM space. Wow. And, and the reason why the, the tagline here is Virtus et Curiositas, right? courage and curiosity, is because I believe that if you can instill those qualities in a four-year-old or five-year-old, let's say kindergarten, pre-K, then that sets them off on a path of lifelong learning. Wow, I think that, that so. deserves a round of applause, surely. Well, I mean, thank you. Yeah, uh, for at least teaching them Latin. Uh, right, yeah. Well, I mean, simply that, for that. Yeah, that was an homage too, because science has Latin origins, and we, so we wanted the tagline to be in Latin, but courage and curiosity are the first two steps on a staircase of, of what we hope will eventually cover things like core, you know, soft emotional skills and how do you get into conversations around self-esteem or bullying, but those are like middle school and high school conversations. Mm. If you want to create more STEM literate, uh, compassionate, leaders, you have to start young. And so mm. that's why we started with pre-K and K. And, and our work, we're, we're working in uh, 20 classrooms last year in Ohio and 40 classrooms this year as we grow. Wow. It's a pilot, so we're just starting this. But, but it's been many years in the making, and we've had a lot of support from funders. Sure. And where else do you think this show is going to take you? Where has it been? Uh, well, it should take me, again, all over the world as we try and bring experts from, from STEM institutions. So NASA, NOAA, Woods Hole, the Smithsonian, who gave us our first grant to do this. Uh, the goal is for me to go in, like I did for, for the networks, go into the field with these STEM leaders and see what they do. So in every episode, which they're five minutes, right? So, so you imagine mm. like on TV, I'm just used to these one hour, five act arcs. Mm. But for Explorer at Large, what we're doing is we're just taking the best five to six minute piece, right? The part where I was rappelling over the cliff or diving with sharks or looking at say how coral growth happens. And we make that the story. So I meet an expert, ask a question, and we go into the field to get an answer. Wow. That's what the teachers are using in the classrooms to start the conversation with kids. And then the kids, the best part of this, the kids become an explorer at large themselves. And they wear their explorer hats, cool. and then they go into the community to become explorers, which mm. is just really satisfying to see. Wow. The five-minute episodes. It's that damn millennials. Yeah. You know, the, the attention span of flies. Yeah. I tell you, yeah. that Instagram. Well, but the fact is, like, kids are locked on in their screens, right? We know right. this. And, and, and the data suggests it's only going to get worse, so to speak. So why not meet them where they are and then try and encourage them to think broader outside the walls of the classroom, beyond their community, and hopefully around the world so that mm. they can... Because, like, this is an American phenomenon, but I'm sure it's... We are slightly xenophobic in terms of our awareness of other countries and cultures. And I think that uh, the best education you can get is from travel. So me, as an advocate for the classrooms, I get to travel, which mm. is you know, good for me because I love it. But, but also, th- through the lens, I get to bring kids along for the journey. Fantastic. Now, traveling is something I wanted to talk to you about because some people, they just travel well. What would be your advice to be a good traveler? 
Uh, well, how do you define good? You know, I think being curious, being willing to go outside the walls of, let's say, your hotel or wherever you're lodging and explore the community, try and think local, because a lot of times tourists go at the, like, the, top, the higher levels of uh, what does the guidebook say you should do. But I, I always appreciate when you have the more cultural, the local flavor of seeing what restaurants the locals go to and, and mm. what, what, what is the vibe uh, without the sort of the higher... Like, I'm, I'm at this stage in my life, having traveled as much as I do, I appreciate the subtleties and the nuance and getting into like the nitty gritty mm. of each country. So I'd say do your research, but then be open to the spontaneity of listening to the locals and finding a path that's perhaps off the regular you know, beaten path. Definitely. Yeah. Now, a friend of mine, yeah. he's got this map on his wall and you know, he's pretty well off. So he's he scratches the countries that he's been to and mm -hmm. the whole thing's nearly filled. It's really infuriating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about your map? If you had that map, is there somewhere that you'd like to explore that you haven't had a chance to yet? Well, we, yeah, well, we were just discussing this. So. Uh, I, I wasn't throwing <laughs> no. you under the bus here. Uh, well, but you know, it's, <laughs> Australia is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad story. I was in Australia, I was in Brisbane airport and I, and I got the call from the network saying I had to be back in the, in the US. And so I flew back and then they said, sorry, you know, mm. you didn't have to be. And I was like, but I was already there, which is the hard part for so many mm. people trying to get from here to there. Uh, so I, I have a, um, an, a long overdue um, invitation, I guess, to go to Australia. Certainly. Yeah. I know the Irwins would love to see you. Yeah. I'm sure they've got a yeah. dozen crocodiles that'd love you to tackle yeah. and kangaroos to ride. I uh, met the Irwin, yeah, when I was at Discoveries after Steve had passed away, but obviously Terry and Vinny, I, I, I'm mm. familiar with them and respect their work. There's no shortage of opportunities in Australia. And then there's the parts of Asia, India that I haven't been to yet. I've been to, just for, for those, like I've been to 75 countries, give or take, right now. Wow. And some of them 20 or 30 times. So I'm pretty deep in certain countries. Um, but I, but I, I know that with 220 countries and territories around the world, there's still much more left to do. Wow. And the more I can bring those into the classrooms, or, and, or I still work for TV networks. I did, I st I'm still a freelance host. So we'll see what the next year brings. But it's exciting yeah. to, be, to be here and to be back, so to speak, in the public arena. Yeah. So this might be a little bit self-serving, but look, you've traveled the world, you have explored all sorts of deserts and, and forests, but mm -hmm. one of the most terrifying uh, jungles is this concrete jungle we're in right now. Uh, for me, uh, yeah. do you have any tips? Because you were born and raised I was, yeah, I was New born York. and raised just a, a mile or two uh, north of here. Uh, I grew up in the city. And, um, yeah, look, it's a different energy, right? New York. Intimidating city, guys. Seriously. Well, we... we Everyone's in a rush. Where are we you are, going? Yeah. So Where it, are you guys that's, going? That's, Constantly that's rushing true. somewhere. That's true. Uh, I, in fact, I noticed that because I don't live in New York now. I live in D.C. But when, every time I come up here, I notice that my pace is, is speeds up and, and my speaking, everything speeds up. It's just a faster form of life, which is, uh, I think, both... Um, exciting, it gets your adrenaline going, and it's slightly exhausting, you know, to maintain mm. that pace. So, but I'd say that New Yorkers appreciate uh, swinging for the fences. You know, you don't pull your punch in this city. We're mm. very, we're very honest and above board. And so, and you strike me as someone who has a lot to say. So just say it, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you got my number, buddy. <laughs> um, all right, now I'm going to delve into something that's uh, probably a bit tough to talk about. What happened to your left fibia? Was it your tibia? It was both. My yeah, it was my. Oh, it was my, both. It was both. Uh, I've had a few breaks over the years. That yeah, that was interesting. You did some research. Um, it's my job. This was this was not on a show. This was, uh, and my friends still give me grief about this. I decided a few years ago to. I had ridden motor. So it's a motorcycle story. Oh and, no! And I had ridden motorcycles on shows where they'd be like, "You're gonna go past the Sphinx on a motorcycle, or you're gonna be, you know, in in Wadi Rum in, jo in Jordan." Get on this motorcycle. And I managed to do, and even, even riding like a Vespa around the Colosseum in Rome, I managed to pull off. But I never had the license. So I was like, I'm going to get my motorcycle license and, you know, make, make this thing legit. And so I called some buddies of mine and I said, I want to go out to Colorado, where I used to live, and get like this off-road motorcycle uh, certificate. And so I got my license and I went out to this off-road program. And... And the first day, they put me on, if you know your bikes, they put me on a 1200, BMW 1200 GSA. Right? Oh, they're Which is great bikes as great well. Great bikes, but pretty much the largest yeah. iron horse. A lot of oomph Speaking about horses, right? Yeah, so, and I, 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 I was great for the first three hours riding that thing, and then a storm came in, and the roads got sloppy. We were off-road, and I just, I lost control of it, mm. and, and just snap, snap, snap. Wow. And um, and yeah, so there's I'm I'm somewhat like Wolverine here. There's a lot of metal yeah. in this leg, um, but I'm you know I can walk. Mm. <laughs> so that's your leg. I noticed you've got a, a brilliant scar there on, on your hand. Yeah, that I mean, just happened a few months ago. 
Uh, that's for a documentary that I'm doing now in the Kingdom of Bahrain. So it's a fascinating story that'll be on air next year. Okay. But, no but the short, the short version, yeah, but I can't spoil it. But the short version is the Kingdom of Bahrain j- just created, and it was announced a few weeks ago, the largest uh, underwater like marine park, right? And they and they sank a 747. God bless the, uh, my friends there. They bought and sank a 747 to create this attraction uh, for divers, and also, and this is where I th- was interested in the story, to create an artificial reef that will help. Um, repopulate the, the the Gulf, right? Because the fi- the corals have collapsed and, and the fish need homes and the coral needs place to attach. So they said, why don't we get this aluminum body of a 747? And well, they sanitized it, so it's not like environmentally it's t- totally inert. And they sank it. And so I was at sea for four days. My company is doing this documentary uh, as as a producer. I'm not hosting it, but I'm creating the doc. And so I was at sea uh, on a navy uh, vessel for four or five days while we're submerging the 747, and a storm came in. And so the sea swells were, you know, like considerable. And and I, I had to jump from the from the from the naval vessel down to a zodiac. And I just misjudged the timing. So instead of mm-hmm. jumping here, I jumped, you know, here and I hit the deck wrong and I and I broke my hand um, and then had emergency surgery the next day oh, where they gosh. put in a fair bit of metal there also. Wow. Um, but my Bahraini friends are pleased because now I'll forever have a little piece of Bahrain with me oh, wherever nice. I go. So, What's yeah. with you in storms, by the way? Did I, you, I'm like, a water really, sign. Did you like annoy so, Thor yeah. the God of Thunder or something? Yeah. Just... Well, Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, it's a good reference. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My mate, but Chris. I love, I love water. Uh, and um, I guess, you know, that, that goes from the quiet stillness of caves to the... To the the violence of hurricanes, all, all things in between. Fantastic. So, yeah. Um, now, I, I've learned that you're no longer a running boss. Uh, for sure. people yeah. who don't yeah. know who what BOSS is. Uh, BOSS is the Boulder Outdoor Survival School. It's the uh, oldest and largest survival school of its kind in the world. It's, I think, our 50, 51st year in business now. And I was there for 25 years. 25 yes. years. Yeah. yeah. I started there as a student uh, in high school and then worked my way up. Uh, to apprentice and then instructor, marketing director, and then I was CEO for 17 years. And then TV came to me, and I I, I kind of changed uh, mm. to do actually to do explore at large more fully. Yeah. Wow, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. I but mean, it's uh, great. It's like just it's not your typical uh, outdoor experience. We turn the clock back about 5,000 years to study how Neolithic uh, people lived, right? So we're looking at we're looking at a uh, life before mostly metal, right? So we're we're, ma- we're making shelters out of the debris in the forest. We're learning how to track animals, read the stars, make fire f- through friction. Uh, it's, it's a very intimate and indigenous-focused understanding of the earth, and the, mm. which gives me, sort of as an anthropology major, another mind, sort of another perspective into the mindset of who came before us. Wow. So it, it married itself well to what I was doing in TV and gave me um, you know, a good foothold into the sort of primitive mindset. I have like a thousand more questions, <laughs> but I'll be greedy because uh, I do have two questions from the audience. Sure. Um, uh, we, we've got one at the back there. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, you've had all of these experiences with exploring and adventuring, but what was the first one that made you want to pursue this as a career? Wow, great question. Well, the, the career p- part, especially like the TV the TV career or the guiding? Let's go with the TV career. So, so I remember, like, yeah, I didn't know what I was signing up for. I literally wrote to, I had, an, you know, an agent, which is like, I put it in quotes, because like, who has an agent? I grew up here. I, I didn't expect to be in TV, but I, I signed up for this opportunity to try this experiment of hosting this show. And I remember it, we were three weeks into what would be nine months of filming, right? So three weeks in, we'd already finished episode one, which was in the Four Corners area on the Anasazi, which was my home turf. So I was very comfortable with that. And then episode two, I was doing a story on the Maya. Uh, this was a pre-class, no, it was a classic Maya story. And I was diving in the cenotes, which again, as we discussed, like that's my religious spiritual temple. So I'm underwater in a cenote, at that point getting my cenote cavern training. I wasn't cave trained yet. And, and if you've ever been to the Yucatan and seen these, like these gorgeous cenotes, these access points, which the Maya held as the sacred sort of intermediary between this world and the underworld, I was, so you're, you're, I'm submerged. All I'm hearing is my own bubbles from the scuba tank and this cathedral of light underwater that I'm flying through. And I was like, this is, this is the greatest job ever, right? Like if they're paying me to experience these moments, sign me up. And I just kept, kept riding that wave. Fantastic question. That was really good. Uh, we do have one more question. Uh, also from the back. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, if you could take anyone uh, living or dead cave diving with you, who would it be and why? You want to go? 
<laughs> no, I'm not going, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the tricky thing about taking so so taking someone cave diving can be a very personal experience, and because you're isolated, unless you have underwater comms, you're not really communicating with that person. So they have they're in their world, and you're in your world. Uh, but I think that for me, uh, the, the scientist, the person who wants to educate, I'd probably be someone who had control around water quality, because someone who had the most influence on how we treat water on this planet, because diving into uh, in effect, the aquifers and springs of our planet gives you a great insight into where the water is, like how healthy it is, and how we can improve it. So I'd probably try to figure out which person at NOAA or at one of the scientific institutions would benefit for, most from this journey so they could come out and create policy change that protects more water, more water sources. It's you know, strategic. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that was a terrifying question. Um, <laughs> right. Do not want to get roped into to that. Um, look, you are someone who has been hands-on with the environment for quite some time. I wasn't really going to talk to you about this, but um, it seems as though with your experience, you're the perfect person to, to ask. Uh, what do you think is currently happening with the world? Is this a, a problem that you think is something that we should all have on the forefront of our minds uh, due to you know, climate change? Yeah. Um, yes. I'm, I'm on record uh, having spoken at a number of, of green conferences and festivals on, on the environment. And as a wilderness guide, I was for years intimately familiar with sort of the impact of our consequences. And I think uh, the consequences of our of our sort of missteps, the, the, the challenge is, for me anyway, I think it comes down to communication. Right? Awareness and communication is the first big step that, that like Greta Thunberg is doing, uh, an interesting and I think admirable job helping people understand climate change and asking the adults to be adults, right? But I think that for many years, for decades, we have ignored the consequences of our actions. And the earth, uh, as we used to say at the survival school, is an impartial judge. You know, There's no good or bad. There's just a reaction to what we've done. And scientists are going to have to solve this problem. So that's why I think that giving scientists a voice and exposing kids to more scientists helps us because by 2050, and this is the sobering thought, I know I'll be quick, but the, but like by 2050, we're going to see an increase in these superstorms, the collapse of oceans, the, perhaps the conveyor belt, the, the decretion of, of, of uh, corals. Like there's a lot happening on the horizon and the scientists of 2050 are in school today. Right? That's why the kids today have to be given the skills and the curiosity and courage to face those challenges, which is what drives us at Explore at Large. So we need to wake up. We can't, we're, we're on a path that has been uh, not sustainable, and we need to make some, some hard choices quickly to, 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 yeah, to continue to live on this planet. Okay, so really simple stuff for yeah. people watching. What's that first really basic thing that we should do to either learn a little bit more about this or to change the way that we live? I think, I think that taking it upon yourself to be responsible for your actions and the impact you have in your community uh, and then internationally. But it starts, you know, all change happens local. It begins locally. So I think that having a mindset, determining what you eat and how that's, what, what, you're, what you're contributing to with your food decisions, with your purchases. You know, I'm a big fan of, uh, our consumer culture is problematic because that disposable mindset creates a lot of waste. Uh, but there, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset shift that has to happen across so many different industries that I think that um, right now the biggest, the biggest change we can make is just awareness. Like, okay, so maybe what I'm doing now isn't really the best for me, my family, the planet. Mm -hmm. And once you have that shift, that opens up uh, an opportunity for more conversations. Okay. So I don't have uh, too much longer with you. Um, and I'm going to make a bold statement here. Uh, I mean, you're an author, you're a survivalist, anthropologist, but I think that at your core, you are a storyteller. What do you think are the stories that are important to tell looking forward? Um, that's a good question. I haven't asked, been asked that before. I think that the stories, look, if you turn the clock back to when we were standing around a fire, right, stories that were always like over the horizon, what's beyond, are compelling. Like the, 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 the hero with a thousand faces and the opportunity to sort of go on your life journey and that growth process, those are compelling. We lo we'll always default to the explorer myth and the sort of the Star Wars, you know, like let's go and travel somewhere and find a guide and then get trained and come back and, and then take out our, our nemesis. But I think the problem that we have today is we need more stories around community. We need more stories that bind us together and help us understand that, that someone else's life isn't necessarily better or worse than yours, or their perspective isn't better or worse. It's just different, and we have to respect those differences. This goes back to why travel is such a great educator. So I would say the more stories, well, this is obviously where I'm sitting for my life, the more stories I can tell that help us break down the barriers, the better we'll, we'll be as a human race. 
And I think that it sounds like you're going to be doing that in Explorer at large. Yes, uh, I'll be doing it, yeah. So we call it XAL. So XAL is the focus for kids. Yep. And like I said, I've got three other documentaries on conservation, on, on the artificial reef, uh, some other things. I'm, like, I'm, I'm fairly busy with different projects. Yeah. Uh, but the goal for all of them is to inspire people to think outside the box, to learn, and then to connect. Sure. And when we're looking forward past this project, what's that next big thing that you're going to be working on? Where will we see the burn? Where will we see him working? <laughs> Well, um, this, this is a 20-year initiative. We're just a few years wow. into it. I, I think if you're going to make real change at a generational level, you have to take kids from age three or four to 23 or 24, right? So it's a 20-year push to create a compassionate, science-literate generation of leaders. So I'm not moving off of this. There's just, i got to pay some bills while we're doing this. <laughs> so I still do some freelance work. Those are Cooper hats don't pay for themselves. Cooper's are know. great. This one's not. This one's a Nathaniel hat. But, but yeah, I had two of Cooper's. They're great. Yeah, I wish I brought mine. You know, we, we, we could have been matching. Uh, could I just say it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Please, a round of applause for Josh Bernstein. You are watching Build Series New York.